all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fossone. I'm the officer of the deck today. We've got some great programs for you. I think you'll find very interesting. We always want to remind you, you can find more about Veterans Radio at its Facebook site or at the web. VeteransRadio.org is our new URL, VeteransRadio.org. Where we're on the web 24-7, you can find a lot of our podcasts there as well. We post new ones every Tuesday, so you can get a new story, a new interview, something you didn't know before by going to veteransradio.org. And before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. First up, we want to thank National Veteran Business Development Council, nvbdc.org. It was established to certify both service-disabled and veteran-owned businesses. You'll find out how they can help your business by going to nvbdc.org. We want to thank Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans fights for veterans' disability rights all across the nation. You can reach them at 800-693-4800 or on the web at LegalHelpForVeterans.com This is a conversation that we had with Vice Admiral Kevin P. Green. He was 30 years in the Navy. We've spoken to him before regarding issues such as uh, the size of the fleet and uh, the relevance of NATO, but we wanted to talk to him about the conversations that are going on on recruiting, recruiting into the military in general, But the Navy in particular, you can't have national security unless you can actually man all of the necessary equipment. So in that regard, I think uh, he's got some insights. He's going to be uh, talking on this issue at the uh, War College soon. So we thought it would be good to get his ideas. He's been thinking about this for over 20 years. So um, I think you'll enjoy this conversation with Vice Admiral Green. Admiral, I'd like to move, if I can, to another topic that you and I have discussed in the past and uh, want to flesh out some more, and that is you can't have all this great gear in the Navy and all these new ships and all this integration with uh, uh, unmanned vehicles uh, in on the water and under the water and cyber things in the space that help project the Navy's uh, intelligence gathering without people. And you've talked and thought about um, it, it, the need for retaining and getting the right uh, total force for a long time. I actually found a, a 20-year-old document you wrote when you were the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Plans, Policy, and Operations. And I know you've written on this topic uh, for uh, a number of different organizations and may actually have a speech coming up on this. So, Admiral Green, give us some thoughts about how today the country makes sure we have the folks in the Navy, both enlisted and officers, to make sure we can meet those four pillars that you outlined uh, earlier as the core missions of the Navy? Jim, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. And let me, let me just begin with, with a, a, a very simple statement. Today's military recruiting shortfall endangers our national security period, end of sentence, end of paragraph. It endangers national security. In this past year, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force all missed their recruiting goals. That's uh, despite the fact that uh, many of them went into their delayed entry program uh, pools, that is, people who uh, signed up to uh, join the service, and they said, well, you know, when I... You know, when it gets to be September, that will be a good time for me to uh, go on to boot camp or to begin my officer training program. Well, it, in some cases, the services had to say, well, we, we can't wait till September now. We've we got to get you on board. So the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force all missed their goals. The Marine Corps made theirs. Uh, they uh, recruited uh, about 5,000 fewer than they did the previous year, but they, they did make their goals, and, and they should get credit for that. 
the Space Force is still very small, and uh, they they made their, uh, their their limited goal. They are growing, however, and and uh, they are they're, they're in the same in the same uh, uh, environment where finding the, the the right kind of people to come in and 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 get them on board, get them trained, and get them deployed is going to be a challenge. Over on the reserve side, the National Guard. Uh, generally did okay. The reserve component did worse than the services. Really, really tough environment for them. Uh, so so why does this matter? Uh, we don't quite have enough people out there. Well, the services uh, end strength has gone down somewhat because of the fact that, that uh, despite the services' best efforts, um, they have fewer people available uh, and, and deployable. Uh, the result of that is that the current operating tempo, that is the operating schedule, the deployment schedule, if you will, of, of trained, equipped, and ready forces to go out and do the work that the military services do, is unsustainable today at the same rates that it has been before, at the same time as certain threats around the world seem to be increasing. A year ago, we did not expect to be shooting down uh, anti-ship ballistic missiles and, and drones in the Red Sea. We didn't expect to be having to put as much focus on si the situation in the Western Pacific uh, or in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean. So the missions are increasing while the services are experiencing manning shortfalls. It's placing unfair hardships on military families. Uh, and I'll get back to that uh, in a minute. I want to talk about the heavy burdens on our reservists and, and the uh, National Guardsmen, their families and their employers. They are deploying at a high rate, a higher rate than anticipated and, and planned for. Uh, the, the, the stress that this situation of decreased manning is, is placing on the force among other things, among other uh, impacts, is making military parents less likely to encourage their own kids to serve because of their deployment schedule. When you have fewer people and you have increasing missions, people are away from home more than usual. Services are downsizing. Billets can't be filled. Shipboard manning across the fleet today is less than 90% averaged out. Some ships, uh, because of their mission and their their uh, specific uh, situations, are fully manned, but across the fleet, the average is under 90%. There's more reliance on retention among the services, keeping folks in service once they're there. Uh, a big part of that is, uh, is financial bonuses. Uh, sometimes it, it's connected with uh, additional training or, or career opportunities. Uh, there's increased use of civilian contractors to do work that previously had been done by military service members. That's expensive. The retention bonuses are expensive. Um, yeah, so, that, some of these problems any business has, right? Uh, you, you had a big role at IBM for a long time. They had the same problems. It, it, is, it is both a combination of how do you get people to join your organization? And that's what they've been missing. That, that's the enlistment miss that's been so significant over the last few years. And then once you get them, you got to keep them, and that's the retention problem. And as I understand it, uh, Admiral, this is happening both with enlisted for the seamen uh, as well as officers in the, in the Navy. They all have different causes and different probable solutions are we doing enough to to uh, discern these different issues and find appropriate solutions? Yes, yeah, there, there's a tremendous amount of work that's that's been going on, and and you're spot on target, Jim. Uh, let's start with demographics. We don't normally think about something like demographics when we're talking about recruiting, but we must. The national birth rate is declining. People are having fewer children. At the same time, our population is aging. And notwithstanding uh, all of the, the concerns and the controversy over our, our borders, 
immigration, in fact, has slowed into the United States in, in the past year, uh, actually the last couple of years. There is a lowered propensity to serve. And what that means is um, military age potential recruits are less familiar with the military. Um, whenever I, in business, whenever I, I meet uh, somebody new and they find out I, I am a veteran, they, w w without exception, will say, well, thank you for your service. I, I'm not sure that they all really understand what that means, but I appreciate it and I thank them and, and then we get on with our conversation. But, but there is less of a connection between the American people and its military force and veterans let me let me bring let me bring that for the veteran radio listeners uh to more of a practical focus if you if you never expose your kid to what an electrician does or what a welder does the odds of your kid ever going into either of those trades and making a good living is nil because he doesn't know what they do Similarly, as fewer and fewer people are involved in the military and pub, that sort of public service to the country, that bigger issue, it, it seems to me it becomes harder for those kids to think, well, maybe this is something I want to do for a while. There's a lot of advantages to it. But if they're not exposed to it, how would they know? That's, I, I, I couldn't say it any better than that. Um, when, when the military is distant and unfamiliar, isolated, insulated, from from the people, um, wh what would why would it occur to somebody that, that that would be a potential career or life experience opportunity for them? Um, and at the same time, uh, th there is an awful lot that goes into qualifying for service. The, the factors of of uh, health and and experience in our youth today are precluding service for many of them. About 20%, 20% of military age uh, young people in the United States today are would be qualified for service, and that's because of obesity issues. We have, and we don't like to talk about it much, we have a national obesity crisis in the United States. We have drug usage, which is disqualifying for military service arrest records, test scores, disqualifying medical conditions, uh, history of medical health treatment, or perceptions of hazards, even, even those who might otherwise be qualified, the, the, you know, the, the, you watch the news or listen to the news or catch it online, and, and what is underlined so often is, is the hazards and the difficulties and things like uh, uh, post trauma stress and and uh, uh, perceptions of other kinds of well that, yeah this is a continuing problem I've got with uh, a lot of the radio ad spots that that run that are supposed to be good PSAs for VA all they do is use veterans with uh, I lost my eye I lost my leg I've got PTSD I have a TBI but you know VAs help me uh, that's a, n not a very good message for trying to recruit uh, kids into the military about the, the power of, of military service. And I don't think snappy ads at the uh, Super Bowl either it, it gets the message across right. So how, how do we move this uh, in, a, in a positive direction? And is it just a whole lot of people doing a whole lot of stuff as compared to some unified, uh, everybody get on the same page? Well, it, it, it's a matter of providing the information that people need to make a, a well-reasoned decision with regard to their futures. Um, and, and, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, uh, discourage anybody from, from following uh, – uh, a, a, uh, their ambition, whether it has to do with college or, or uh, going into the workforce, but the opportunities. If, if you talk, if you talk to the folks in the National Guard, who uh, uh, are are really focused sharply on on the issue of, of veterans finding work in the uh, in the private sector, they blow away the competition. 
because they've lived in a in a disciplined, orderly, uh, well well managed environment for years. They have learned the habits of of adults. They have learned how to live their lives uh, responsibly and well and contribute and, and understand that that uh, leadership isn't just a matter of standing on a box and yelling at people, um, but uh, the, the experience that they had in uniform carries over beautifully into the private sector as well. In other words, what a military uh, tour of duty or career provides to people is extraordinary confidence in themselves, extraordinary capabilities, extraordinary knowledge and expertise that they would have a very difficult time finding otherwise. Um, and, and I say that with full understanding that by all projections uh, with, our, with regard to our, our uh, economy, the next 10 years or so is going to be a job seekers market. Being prepared for that market, having the qualifications that military experience provides, uh, really puts somebody in a catbird seat, so to speak. Um, and there are lots of, of other ways that we can uh, deal with this issue. But I, I think just, just looking at the numbers and, and, and the facts are important. Um, I, I wanted to mention one of the things, because you brought up obesity and uh, health conditions. I think I'm reading that uh, all military services, Navy included, is becoming more attuned to health, uh, giving waivers on health issues uh, because of a, both the, recru the recruiting needs, but also maybe a recognition that today versus 20 or 30 years ago, we go to the doctor for everything, right? So there's a record of somewhere of you sneezed once, oh, you might not be qualified now. So if you're out there thinking, I'd like to do this, but maybe I don't have the greatest health, uh, there is this concept of waivers that, as I say, I'm reading that are being used more, and there's plenty of evidence that those who get into service with a waiver do just as well as everybody else. So maybe we've overplayed yeah. some of those issues. Yeah, I, I spent three years uh, commanding up at Great Lakes, where the Navy's uh, boot camp is located, and yeah, very, very familiar w with these issues. And it, but w there are a number of things that are really encouraging. What we found up there, when and this was 25 years ago, was that the more focused uh, the leadership is on on improving people and strengthening people. The, the better the retention, the better they do in boot camp and, and beyond. The services have uh, just in the in the past year or so developed courses that uh, provide uh, that, that address issues having to do with obesity, physical fitness, being able to run, and all of that prior to people ship off to boot camp. They also have new programs for academic remediation to get people up to pass the the uh, ASVAB, the, the entry exam uh, uh, requirement as well. They're, they're taking advantage of the fact that, you know, why did somebody not graduate from high school? Was it because they didn't have the intellectual potential or they were undisciplined? Not at all. In many cases, they had to help bring food and, and money into the house. They, they've been working since they were 16 years old or so. Um, and this is an unfortunate but but uh, and often unacknowledged fact. <clears throat> and, and these are people who, in many cases, have already learned a pretty good group of lessons about leadership and about discipline. Um, these are people who uh, who could have a, a superb future in the service. I served. Uh, you know, I, I served uh, for a long time and started a long time ago. I served with w when the draft was still uh, upon us, and uh, a, a good number of those folks were not high school graduates, but they were good sailors. They performed well, they were disciplined, and they were learning all the time. They got an education during their enlistments, uh, and uh, it wasn't forced on their throats. They were. Well, it, they took it, they yeah, took I think I think you're hitting on a point that I want to get across to folks if they're out there listening and think, I'm not the ideal candidate. I'm not the muscle bound so and so. You know, zero percent body fat. 
the military will wants you and will meet you where you're at. And if that means they have to help you with a health waiver or bring you in and help you on getting some educational goal uh, before everything qualifies or get you, uh, as you say, running, uh, you know, uh, obes- obesity issues. Today's military is really interested in, in recruiting and helping folks, meeting them where they're at and helping them get into shape to be a good service member. And that includes, and I've talked to a lot of uh, single mothers who say, I got in because I needed this, that, and the other thing. And they worked with me knowing I had, uh, you know, I was a young single mother. Uh, so it's a, it's kind of a, a different, I think there's a different culture going on in recruiting that really meets the person where they're at. Am, am I overreading that? I don't think you are at all. I, I think, I think again, you've, you've hit the target right in the center. In, in, in my view, uh, if, uh, if you're otherwise qualified and you've got ambition and heart, um, there's a place for you in uniform. And uh, the services appreciate that. And, uh, you know, there, there's an open door. And, you know, in, in, in some cases, it may not work out. That's always the case. It's, you know, it has always been true in the military that, that there are some folks who, uh, as much as they want to, can come in and, and, it, and it doesn't work out for them. That number is shrinking because of better leadership, better systems, better programs, and a determination to put the, uh, the real treasure of our country, that is its young people, uh, into situations where they can succeed, they can do well, they can become proud of themselves, and they can go on and uh, serve the country uh, in uniform and beyond. Well, I, I really do appreciate Admiral Green is spending some time with us again to talk about this important issue, which is uh, recruiting in, into the Navy and military service in general. I think you hit it on the head when you said, just said, if you have the right ambition and heart, military service is going to be available to you and it's going to be a wonderful experience. That's really it. If you bring those characteristics to the table, today's military is interested in working with you in getting you into uh, military service. So uh, Vice Admiral Kevin P. Green retired from the United States Navy after 30 plus years. We really appreciate your thinking and and on these issues and spending some time with Veterans Radio today. Thank you, Jim. It's been a pleasure. And I want to thank everybody for listening to Veterans Radio today. I am Jim Fawson. It's been a pleasure to be your host. I'm a veterans disability lawyer at Legal Help for Veterans, and you can reach us at 800-693-4800 or legalhelpforveterans.com on the web. You can follow Veterans Radio on Facebook and listen to its podcasts and Internet radio shows by visiting us at veteransradio.org. That's veteransradio.org. And until next time, you are dismissed. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. We again want to thank our... National sponsors, the National Veterans Business Development Council, NVBDC.org, VA Ann Arbor Health Care System, the Vietnam Veterans of America, Charles S. Kettles Chapter, Ann Arbor, Michigan, VFW Graf O'Hara Post 423 in Ann Arbor, and the American Legion Press Corn Post 46, also in Ann Arbor. We appreciate all your support. You can go to veteransradio.net click on the sponsor level and continue to support keeping veterans radio on the air and until next time you are dismissed